Okay, good afternoon. As you see, we have a couple guests with us today. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, uh, today we celebrate 20 years of American leadership, cooperation, and support for the preservation of cultural heritage around the world through the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. Since the fund launched on April 3rd, 2001, U.S. embassies have used this public diplomacy program to support disaster preparedness and response effort overseas, to spur economic development, to adapt to climate change, and promote American values, such as respect for cultural diversity. In the process, our embassies have provided educational and career development opportunities for American students and professionals from nearly all 50 states. For example, in 2019, a 6.4 magnitude earthquake hit Albania and damaged three ancient fortifications. With a grant of nearly $800,000, the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation is supporting the emergency stabilization of the structures, a, a conservation analysis for each fortification, and reconstruction of the damaged sections. In, Bos in Bosnia and Herzegovina and other post-conflict countries, embassies have incorporated the fund into the recovery and reconciliation efforts. In Rwanda, our embassy used the program to help preserve the memory and evidence of lives lost in 1994. And in northern Iraq, uh, our embassy has used the program to mitigate the effects of genocide by preserving cultural sites of terrorized communities. Through more than 1,000 projects thus far, the Ambassadors Fund continues to incorporate cultural preservation and protection into American diplomacy. Moving on to the release of the department's newly published report to walk the earth in safety, which those of you in the room uh, have in front of you and which is also available on our website, www.state.gov. Uh, this annual report highlights the United States' enduring commitment to making post-conflict communities safer and setting the stage for their recovery and development. I would like to introduce Acting Assistant Secretary Tim Betts from our Political Military Affairs Bureau, uh, who will first make brief remarks, along with Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Stan Brown, uh, who is then prepared to take your questions. So uh, with that, Acting Assistant Secretary Betts, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ned, for that introduction, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to release the 20th edition of To Walk the Earth in Safety, the annual report of the U.S. Conventional Weapons Destruction, or CWD, program. For more than 25 years, the United States has demonstrated its commitment to protecting civilians through support for destruction of at-risk conventional weapons, and the clearance of landmines, IEDs, and unexploded ordnance. Over that period, we have provided more than $4 billion in CWD assistance in more than 100 countries. The success of the U.S. CWD programs relies not only on the technical abilities of our implementing partners, but also on the active support and participation of the affected states and communities. Early on, we recognized that every individual should be included in mine action activities for peace and security gains to be sustained. One way NGO implementing partners encouraged uh, inclusivity was to recruit women deminers. Today, women across the globe work in all aspects of mine action, making their families and communities stronger. From leading survivor advocacy in the De uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, to providing municipal government oversight in Bosnia and Herzegovina, to training deminers in Laos, this edition of To Walk the Earth in Safety highlights the accomplishments of women in our uh, improving lives through U.S. CWD program segments. Protecting civilians is at the core of the U.S. CWD assistance. These programs help to pr protect our nation and our citizens, promote economic opportunity and prosperity, and build strong partners who will help us advance America's interests on the global stage. Projects to secure state-held small arms and light weapons from Africa to Europe to Central America support security. The disposal of excess and unserviceable munitions reduces the risk of unplanned explosions 
at military storage sites located close to populated areas. For example, in, um, where did my prop go? Here it is. Uh, for example, uh, as illustrated in the report's cover photo, uh, ITF Enhancing Human Security, one of our longest standing partners, is in coordination with the Kyrgyz Ministry of Defense, demilitarized more than 45,000 pieces or more than 200 metric tons of expired large cal caliber ammunition. <clears throat> uh, even with such assistance, unplanned explosions continue to happen, and we're, we're prepared to respond on short notice. Most recently, our Quick Reaction Force, which is highlighted in the report, deployed to Equatorial Guinea to assist with ordnance disposal following the March 7th explosion at the military base in Bata. Following the port of Beirut explosion on August 4th of last year, State Department funded teams undertook a stockpile security assessment that led to upgrades to the Lebanese Armed Forces 1st Artillery Regiment Ammunition Depot to reduce the risk of another catastrophic explosion. The Interagency Man Portable Air Defense Systems, or MANPADS, task force supports MANPADS recognition training seminars to assist foreign security officials at airports, border crossings, and seaports in their advanced weapons systems counterproliferation efforts. Adapting the course curriculum to a virtual format enabled the training of officials from the Middle East and North Africa in our pandemic constrained environment, providing them with the skills needed to reduce the threat of, to civil aviation from manpads. Implementing partners have also adapted as traditional methods of in-person delivery are complicated by the global pandemic. Uh, for example, the Swiss Federation for Demining ran an explosive ordinance risk education campaign in Iraq on Facebook that reached more than 230,000 people. The department successfully partnered with Facebook and NGO Mine Action Group, or MAG, in 2019 to pilot risk education over social media in areas of northern Iraq liberated from ISIS. It was effective in reaching far more civilians than traditional methods, Nine, over 983,000 persons in three months. In November of 2020, we launched phase two of that program, which will deliver risk education to more than 9 million at-risk civilians in Iraq, Lebanon, Somalia, and Vietnam. CWD assistance for the clearance of explosive hazards reduces the risk to civilians from accident or injury from unexploded ordnance or IEDs in post-conflict areas in Iraq, Libya, and Syria. As can be seen on the back cover, um, civilians often return home uh, to a sobering reality in the search for, uh, in, in seeing that their homes had been searched and marked safe. These projects provide safe access to buildings and other infrastructure, which is ne necessary to rebuild their communities. Finally, the U.S. commitment is grounded in over 25 years of bipartisan <coughs> congressional support combined with the experience and determination of our implementing <coughs> partners. Together, we have worked with host governments as well as communities at the local level to create a resilient program that has evolved and adapted along with the explosive remnants of war threat. Our CWD program has been flexible enough to continue performing and producing tangible results despite the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to seeing our programs running at full capacity again in the near future. That's all I've got as far as an overview of the, of the report. Um, now, uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Stan Brown and I uh, will be happy to take your, your questions, nice. mainly him. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you wanna go ahead? <laughs> yeah, please. Um, so, you know, last year, and I'm sure you're prepared for this, so I'll, I'll expect a uh, fairly concise recitation of whatever talking points you have Are you down there. Are you saying you're predictable? 
I'm saying that what you're going to say is predictable. Okay. Uh, so last year, the former administration rescinded the landmine policy as it relates to the Ottawa Treaty. And uh, I just want to know if you guys are considering reinstating what that policy had been. And I, I'm familiar with the, what, it, what it was before and what it is now. Are you going back to um, that form, that old policy, or are you going to stick with it? So right now, that, that policy is in effect, as you all know, and uh, we haven't had any discussions yet in the administration on changing the policy. Uh, so um, basically, it removed the geographic restriction of Korea, and now geographic commanders can decide uh, the use of landmines, uh, which is a pretty high bar. So uh, no uh, decision has been made, and no uh, study has been done yet. Well, is it something that the administration is looking into? Is it prepared to review, or you know, what? Where, where, where does it stand, or is it not an issue? Is it not a priority right now? Uh, it has not because been. This is a long book, which seventy-two pages, including the back cover, which your colleague mentioned, um, about the the problem that this. Right. No, I understand. Uh, so the United States will continue to be the largest donor, as you say. It talked about the book. We've donated four billion since uh, uh, 1993 to 100 countries. Uh, we continue to uh, be the larger donor uh, to this effort, uh, and have uh, impacted countries, uh, 49 countries around the world. Uh, I'm sure there will be a discussion on this, but uh, we haven't started that discussion yet. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Egypt is listed as uh, one of the most contaminated countries. With, with landmines, despite the fact that the last war they had was in 1973. Why is that? Why does it continue to be such a daunting task? I mean, there are something like 23,000, maybe 25,000 mines, uh, mines and so on, despite peace treaties, despite U.S. involvement. Right. So the, the process of removing landmines is, I, I don't know, if you look through the uh, publication, you'll see uh, the work is very much done by individuals from the local communities. It's very uh, intensive. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, it may vary from anything from uh, requirement for the host country to want to remove them, a request for assistance if they need assistance to move them, as well as uh, uh, looking at it from the type of devices, the type of uh, geography, vegetation, and otherwise, and the tools that are needed to remove those things. So uh, uh, we are still removing ordnance from World War II in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and you'd think that that would be done by now, but no, it's, it takes a long time and it's very painstaking to do so. Could, it, could they be banned? I mean, could, could you envision uh, a future without landmines? I mean, considering they're a very cheap weapon. Uh, 164 uh, countries have signed up to the Ottawa Convention ban. Uh, the United States has not, uh, I think, as Matt has pointed out here. Uh, and, um, and owing to our commitment to a Korea under the last administration was the, where the restriction uh, rest or the, the requirements rest. Uh, and currently, uh, the Department of Defense owns the uh, policy. So I would defer you to them for the operational reasons why they would still need them. Uh, yeah, Tom. Could you speak to... Um U.S.-sponsored programming in Syria and whether or not this administration shares the view of the previous administration that um, such stabilization programs should be the job of other countries in the region and not the U.S. government? Uh, Syria specifically is under review as far as uh, what kind of uh, assistance we might add there. Uh, we have provided uh, the U.N., uh, I think it was a million dollars, uh, for mostly risk education in regards to Syria. Prior to that, we did have extensive clearance operations on the ground, uh, basically around IEDs to uh, clear critical infrastructure and to provide for populations going back to Syria. Uh, that kind of work still continues on in Iraq uh, after ISIS's departure uh, and clearing about 500, uh, uh, I guess, uh, critical infrastructure uh, type facilities there. So we're still doing the, the work that has been, I guess, uh, characterized as stabilization in some of these areas immediately after conflict or when conflict's over. Any final questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on the rollout. Do you have a question for them? Oh, not for you. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's staying. Well, I, I, mean, he's staying. I, I would like to congratulate you on this very glossy book. Uh, yeah. uh, this is this is very nice. Thank you. Hopefully, you read about see, the Well, let's see. You know, uh, I'll have to delve into the content exactly. to see. <laughs> <laughs> so,
Yes. Well, we, thank you. Yeah, I think it has contact information if you have other questions. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Congratulations. Ned, do you have a top uh, the only topper I had was uh, what I delivered at first. Okay, can I go ahead? Uh, sure. 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 Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Um, Just got back from holiday and very keen to see clearly. <laughs> well, um, welcome back, I should say. Yeah, thanks. Um, just uh, wanted to ask uh, about Ukraine. Um, so I just want to ask very clearly, mm -hmm. what is the U.S. assessment on Russian troop movements near the eastern Donbass region in re Ukraine? Do you believe Russia is getting ready for a fresh offensive? And what is the United States prepared to stop that? President Biden said, offered his unwavering support. In what form will that be? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not my job to speak to what might be motivating the Russians. It is my job to speak to what the United States government is doing about it. Um, and let me say uh, very clearly, as I did last week, that we are concerned um, by recent escalating Russian aggressions in eastern Ukraine. Uh, including the credible reports that have been emanating about uh, Russian troop movements on Ukraine's borders uh, and occupied Crimea. Uh, the movements were, of course, preceded by violations of the mid-2020, the July 2020 ceasefire that led to the deaths of four uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, last month on March 26th, I believe it was, uh, and the wounding of two other uh, Ukrainian personnel. Um, Russia's destabilizing actions undermine uh, the de-escalation intentions achieved through the OSCE brokered agreement of uh, July of last year. Uh, and in, in addition to our reassurances to Ukrainian officials, uh, we're discussing our concerns about this increase in tensions uh, in ceasefire violations uh, and regional tensions with NATO allies, of course. And uh, the other week in, in Brussels, this was a broad uh, topic of uh, discussions. We've asked Russia for uh, an explanation uh, of these provocations. Uh, but most importantly, what we have signaled uh, directly with our Ukrainian partners is a message of reassurance. Uh, you saw that in the readout that President Biden had of his call uh, with President Zelensky of Ukraine. Of course, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, spoke with the head of the presidential office, Andrei Yermak, uh, last week as well. Secretary Blinken in this building uh, spoke uh, with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba, uh, and Secretary Austin spoke with Defense Minister Andrei Tehran, and I believe uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff also uh, spoke with his uh, counterpart. So at the highest levels of government, literally, um, across multiple institutions, we have sent uh, that message very clearly to our uh, Ukrainian counterparts uh, and implicitly um, to the Russians uh, as well, uh, that we stand by uh, Kiev, we stand by our partner, uh, Ukraine in the face of this intimidation and aggression. Can I ask you just to follow up on that? Can I just ask you once again? I mean, do you believe that this buildup on the Russian side of the border, on Russian territory, is a provocation in that you think it's some kind of buildup for an invasion? Or is it, do you have a, do you have just have a, an objection to Russia moving its troops around inside of its own territory. What we certainly have an objection to and what certainly is a cause uh, for concern for us is Russia's escalating aggression in eastern Ukraine, um, including, as I mentioned, the troop movements on Ukraine's borders okay. uh, and well, occupied Crimea. Yeah. But now, let me just say, uh, I will leave it to Moscow to speak to what it is they may be uh, in the process of doing any signals they want to send. but. I will say uh, that the United States uh, would certainly be concerned um, by any effort on the part of Moscow, whether it is within Russian territory uh, or within sovereign Ukraine, to intimidate um, uh, our partner, uh, Ukraine. Okay, fair enough. So you think, you believe that the troop movements, the Russian troop movements that are happening inside of Russia are an attempt to use intimidate Ukraine. I said we would be concerned I, by attempts on I'm asking you whether you think it, that the, it is or not. The, the, this involves assessments uh, that are, um, uh, in many cases, going to be undergirded by non-public information. So I wouldn't want to well, speak from but, here. But, I, w I wouldn't know. My, my point is I wouldn't want to. you are speaking from here. No, I, no, I am speaking so. from here about our policy concerns. Yes, I, okay. I wouldn't want to speak from Fine. here about what but, it is that Russia may be attempting to do I or attempting understand. to signal. I, I will say that I, if the implication of this is uh, if, in, intimidation, if, 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 intimidation yes, of our Ukrainian it, partners. Is that, is that your assessment, that it is intimidation? Or is it 
or is it just a country moving troops inside of its own borders, which you do, which China does, which Kenya does, which Brazil does? I mean, I, I think I think you're throwing a lot of apples and oranges uh, t together with this. I think. No, I'm, look, just, I'm just trying to find out I mean, if you think that Russia moving its own troops inside its own territory is intimidation towards Ukraine. Good. I mean, fine. But I, say that. Don't don't just say if it is, then we would have a problem with it. Obviously, there is a history here that goes back to 2014 yes. and even before that. And yes. so I think that is uh, relevant context when we talk about. Uh, and when we think about and when we respond on a policy basis uh, to what we are currently seeing in eastern Ukraine and occupied Crimea uh, and within Russia itself. Um, of course, the Russians have uh, uh, for quite some time uh, sought to intimidate uh, and to bully uh, not, their, I, their I neighbors. I'm not doubting that. I just, uh, want to know, I just want to know if you think that these specific troop movements that you've been talking about for the last 10 days now, or week now, uh, you think that those are intended to be intimidation? Well, the the message uh, we are sending to Ukraine um, is one of reassurance, uh, and you have heard that at the highest levels. Um, the United States continues to stand by uh, our Ukrainian partners. Um, we will do that uh, without exception. Other questions? Yes. Uh, can I move to uh, Jordan, please? Sure. Uh, does the uh, State Department have clear picture now of what's going on in, in Jordan. I mean, what the Jordanian officials described as plot to destabilize the country. Well, I would leave it to our Jordanian partners uh, to speak to um, uh, what they uh, may have found. What I will say is that we are following the situation in Jordan closely. We made that very clear over the weekend. Um, and we have been in, in touch uh, with Jordanian officials um, because Jordan, of course, uh, is a strategic partner of the United States. We value uh, immensely our uh, relationship um, uh, and King Abdullah II's leadership. Um, we value his integrity, his vision, uh, and as we said over the weekend very clearly that the king has our full support. Uh, and that is in large part because Jordan is a close friend. It is uh, an invaluable strategic partner, uh, and it's an indispensable partner on a range of shared concerns uh, and challenges throughout the region. Uh, the United States and Jordan, of course, uh, share mul the mutual goal of a negotiated uh, two-state solution in which Israel uh, lives in peace and security alongside a viable uh, Palestinian state. Uh, we support jointly an end to violent extremism uh, that threatens uh, security in the region, including uh, within the kingdom, uh, and more broadly as well. Of course, Jordan has also been an invaluable partner in addressing virtually all of the highest priority challenges facing the region, including um, by helping to mitigate the humanitarian crisis caused by the Syrian conflict. Um, Jordan has helped to make progress towards a political transition in, in Syria, ensuring uh, the enduring uh, defeat of ISIS uh, as well. Uh, we've said before that we um, value and appreciate the Jordanians' extraordinary assistance to the Syrian people, including um, by hosting so many uh, refugees. And we remain committed uh, to working with uh, Jordan uh, to address the threat posed by ISIS, uh, and also supporting Jordan uh, in any threats uh, to its borders, including those uh, posed by ISIS uh, as well. And I have uh, another question on uh, Iran. On the eve of Vienna talks tomorrow, uh, I'm wondering who is going to participate from the American officials. Some media reports reveal that the goal is to achieve two separate deals with the U.S. and Iran agreeing on certain steps with clear timetables. So uh, can you confirm that? Well, as we announced last week, as we announced on Friday, we have agreed to participate in talks with our European, Russian, and Chinese partners, the uh, P5 plus one uh, partners who were uh, who remain party to uh, the JCPOA, um, to discuss the issues involved in a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Mutual meaning on the part of Iran uh, and on the part of the United States. Uh, that has long been the proposition on the table. I can confirm uh, that Special Envoy for Iran, Rob Malley, uh, will lead the U.S. delegation to Vienna. These talks uh, are scheduled to start uh, tomorrow. I would also hasten to add, as we did late last week, that uh, 
we don't underestimate the scale of uh, the challenges ahead. These are early days. Uh, we don't anticipate an early or immediate breakthrough um, as these discussions we fully expect will be difficult. Um, but we do believe uh, that these discussions with our partners and in turn our partners uh, with uh, Iran is a healthy step, step forward. Now you asked about uh, how these talks uh, will be structured and what they'll be predicated on. Um, they'll be structured around working groups uh, that are European, uh, that, are, that the EU um, is going to form uh, with the remaining uh, parties to the JCPOA, and that includes uh, Iran. The primary issues to be discussed are actually uh, quite simple. Uh, they're on the one hand, the nuclear steps that Iran would need to take in order for Iran uh, to return to that desired end state, and again, that is uh, an end state of compliance with the JCPOA, uh, and the sanctions relief steps uh, that the United States uh, would need to take in order for us to return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. So again, um, that is uh, uh, what we aspire uh, over the longer term to achieve, that mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. It's precisely what President Biden, then candidate Biden, uh, laid out on uh, the campaign trail. Now, um, we don't anticipate at present that there will be direct talks uh, with Iran, um, though of course we uh, remain open to them. Um, uh, and so we'll have to see uh, how things go starting I earlier have, this week. Yep. Yeah, I have uh, two quick uh, follow-ups on, on, on that. Uh, there was a Los Angeles uh, Times report quoting some Pentagon officials as saying that the tensions are so severe that it might not be possible to delay further without a deal, restri uh, a, a deal restricting the Iranian nuclear program, and they are warning of a confrontation in case there is no deal. And also, I have like uh, my question is how urgent does the U.S. government feel that it is necessary to reach a deal in the coming two months? And also, a Western official was quoted as saying that the aim during those talks is to reach an agreement within two months. Do you well, share this hope? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to put a, a time frame on it. Uh, we are conducting principled diplomacy. We're conducting that principled diplomacy in close coordination uh, with our European allies, uh, with whom uh, we discussed the broad challenge of Iran uh, the other week in Brussels. Uh, of course, we do have uh, some area of tactical alignment in this case with uh, China and Russia uh, as well. Um, so the diplomacy will, meet, will move uh, at the speed um, that uh, um, we deem it appropriate to move at. Um, to your question about the urgency of this challenge, look, there's no denying um, that we are approaching this with urgency. Um, and we are doing so because even in recent weeks, Iran has continued to take steps away from the JCPOA. And our concern with that is that over time, uh, Iran's uh, the so-called breakout time has continued to shrink. Just a reminder that at the end of the Obama administration, the Obama-Biden administration, that breakout time uh, when the JCPOA was fully in effect was 12 months. That breakout time into the last administration, the Trump administration, was 12 months when the JCPOA was fully in effect. Um, with, the, with both sides having distance itself uh, from the JCPOA and Iran taking uh, these steps, including the steps that have been reported on in recent days, uh, that time has dwindled. Our goal is, of course, to see to it that that breakout time uh, is as long as possible. Um, our overarching goal is to ensure that Iran's nuclear program is permanently and verifiably constrained, uh, and that on a permanent and verifiable basis, Iran will not be able to obtain a nuclear weapon. That is not just our goal. Uh, that is the goal of our remaining partners in the P5 plus one. Uh, it is the goal of our uh, partners and allies uh, in the region, and certainly a goal that has broad support uh, within Congress as well. So uh, we are not seeking to drag these talks on any longer than necessary, um, but we're also not going to cut corners, um, given, that, uh, given the profound stakes uh, that are at play here. Sorry. Hold on a second. Just on this. Your remaining partners in the P5 plus one? You guys are the no the, the participants <laughs> in the P5 plus one and yeah, the JCPOA. Well, you, you have no partners. We in the, well, in, we are yeah. technically we are a 
we're still in the P5. Let's not, let's not. <laughs> well, uh, yes, but not in the deal. So uh, can you say, though, that you're not prepared to lift any sanctions uh, or ease any sanctions that are non-nuclear rela related? Well, I can as be. part of this. I, I can, there are plenty of sanctions, as you right. know, there are plenty of sanctions that are non-nuclear related, mm -hmm. that, that are not contingent on, uh, on the deal. Right. Uh, yeah. What I can say is that uh, we certainly will not entertain unilateral gestures or concessions to get Iran um, to induce um, Iran uh, to a better place. Our goal at these talks in Vienna, um, again, is to set the stage for that mutual return to compliance. Uh, the original formulation is one that still holds today. It's uh, the uh, limited lifting of sanctions, nuclear sanctions, uh, in return for per permanent and verifiable limits on Iran's yeah. nuclear program. Yeah, now, I'm, I'm not going to uh, you know, preview from here um, what that look, might look like on our side, but I think uh, that formulation is one uh, that the JCPOA remains in existence. It is right. one that the JCPOA itself continues to call for. So I would imagine uh, that um, as we uh, look at the steps that we need to take, we'll be guided uh, by the original formulation that was in the JCPOA. Okay. So when you say you're not prepared to make any inducements, that means no non nuclear sanctions relief. I will leave it to the negotiators to uh, to detail positions. Well, that's not going to, you know, that, that that's going to be a that's going to be a problem. If you say that you're prepared to lift non-nuclear sanctions. I'm not. I'm absolutely not saying that. I, I am saying that so our negotiators. I'm leave it to the negotiators. I am so saying that our negotiators will go to, are headed to Vienna uh, to uh, take part in talks with our partners starting tomorrow uh, to discuss how Iran might get back into compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, and Iran getting back into compliance would mean uh, the strict and verifiable limits on Iran's nuclear program, permanent limits on Iran's nuclear program. They will also discuss uh, the sanctions uh, relief that the United States would be prepared to take. Uh, and of course, we'll continue to be guided by what the original JCPOA called for. So which I, is nuclear Which is sanctions. nuclear sanctions. So I, again, yeah. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions on the Palestinian issue. Uh, couple of Anything issues. else on Iran before we move on? Can I ask one more thing sure. on Iran? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering what a productive result from these meetings would look like. Mm -hmm. Is it that the U.S. writes down exactly what concessions they're willing to give and Iran writes down what nuclear concessions they're willing to give? Like, what, what should we be looking for at the end of this? I think we are looking for a better understanding of how we might arrive at that desired end state. Uh, and that desired end state remains compliance for compliance. Uh, of course, we haven't had uh, uh, direct discussions um, with the Iranians about this. We'll be working indirectly through uh, primarily our European um, partners on this. But if we come away from Vienna with a better understanding of, of how both sides uh, can get there, and um, the result of which would be how Iran could move back into compliance with the JCPOA, and what we would need to do uh, to see to that. I think that's what we're after. Said. Thank you, Ned. A couple of days ago, Secretary Blinken spoke to his Israeli counterpart, Ashkenazi, but he has not, uh, maybe for the third time, I think this was his third conversation with him as Secretary of State, he has not spoken to any Palestinian uh, leader. Why is that? Why has he not reached out to Dr. Riyad Maliki, the, uh, the foreign minister of the uh, Palestinian Authority? Well, we have been clear um, that it is a priority of this administration uh, to engage the Palestinian people um, uh, as well as the Palestinian uh, leadership. Uh, and we've talked about uh, resuming assistance to the Palestinian people um, and the priority that uh, we attach uh, to it. Uh, just the other week, of course, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield announced uh, $15 million uh, in uh, uh, humanitarian assistance to provide relief to um, Palestinians uh, throughout the West Bank and Gaza um, who are currently uh, suffering from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, we will continue um, to provide assistance to benefit all Palestinians, including uh, refugees, and we're determining uh, at the moment how to move forward with that. 
um, look, I, I would fully expect that uh, there will continue to be engagement with um, the Palestinian people um, and and Palestinian are, leaders are as well. Engaging with any Palestinians? I mean, what what level of engagement do you have right now? Yeah, yeah. I, I we typically don't read out conversations uh, at the working level, but um, certainly uh, we are prepared to um, uh, continue to engage. Uh, the Palestinians, including Palestinian uh, government officials, um, on ways we can provide uh, assistance to the Palestinian people. So during the campaign, there were unambiguous statements by uh, by you know the candidate Joe Biden then about you know resuming aid to UNRWA and so on. We have not heard anything since the administration has assumed office. Since that, well, that's uh, not true. That's not true. Of course, uh, you heard from on UNRWA. On UNRWA, I know that there's been aid. For, to combat to combat to combat uh, COVID, mm -hmm. there's probably been an increase in aid to the PA, but on UNRWA, there has not been any clear. It, it is certainly message. true. It remains true today that uh, we intend to provide assistance that will benefit all Palestinians. We spoke. Uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield spoke to that uh, the other week, um, and that includes, of course, refugees. Um, we're we're in the process. Well, you keep saying refugees. But we UNRWA we, we is, are we are in the process of determining uh, how exactly we'll move forward. Um, on providing that assistance, of course, uh, at all times consistent with, with U.S. law. Would you resume aid to UNRWA? Uh, we are, we are uh, uh, looking at the ways we can provide assistance to Palestinians, including Palestinian refugees. Can I ask three questions? For you? They're yes or no, very easy on this These are issue. yes no questions are usually yes. not the easy ones. Oh, yeah, oh, they are. Uh, you, said, you said that you're not going to move the embassy out of Jerusalem, but uh, does this administration still regard Jerusalem as Israel's capital? And do you still believe that uh, a two-state solution would result in uh, Palestinians having a capital in East Jerusalem? These are not yes, no questions, Matt, just to clarify. Uh, uh, yes th there's, no. there's been no change on our position in Jerusalem. And of course, Jerusalem is a final status issue that is to be negotiated by uh, the two the parties. The previous administration declared, said that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. That's, and I said and there's been no is, change on our no position change. in Jerusalem. Okay, and on the Golan? There's been no change in our position. And then back on Jerusalem, on the passport issue? There's there, been there's, no change in our there's position. There's no... Is there any thought of changing it? We, of course, don't discuss uh, internal deliberations, but there's been no change but in our position. You know what I'm talking about, though. I, I do know okay. what you're talking right. about. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I will just note, we uh, unfortunately need to um, conclude here in the next few minutes, given the event with the Secretary. But yes. A couple questions in Ethiopia. Sure. Um, at, last, at the end of last week, Amnesty International, CNN, BBC um, verified videos that they say show a massacre by Ethiopian uh, forces. Do you have any response to that? Uh, and, and is it something that the U.S. government has confirmed as well? Well, we are gravely concerned um, by reported human rights violations, uh, abuses, and atrocities uh, in the Tigray, Tigray region of Ethiopia. Um, we strongly condemn uh, the killings, the forced removals, uh, the sexual assaults, the other human rights abuses uh, that multiple organizations uh, have uh, reported. But any any word on whether or not you believe Ethiopian forces have conducted these particular massacres? Uh, we've we are of course looking into uh, these reports. Um, we have taken close note of them, um, and uh, and will continue to uh, uh, pay close attention. And then um, on Saturday, the Ethiopian Foreign Ministry said that Eritrean forces have begun to leave the country. Is mm -hmm. that something that you've been able to verify as well? Well, we have taken note of uh, the uh, what we heard from uh, Ethiopian uh, authorities. Um, we are encouraged by the Prime Minister's announcement uh, that the government of uh, the state of Eritrea has agreed to withdraw its forces from Ethiopia. Uh, the immediate and complete withdrawal of Eritrean troops from Tigray uh, will be an important step forward in de-escalating the conflict uh, and restoring peace and regional stability. But you haven't seen whether or not they've started that process. We've, we, we've encouraged by that report. We'll be paying close attention, of course. Can I just one other quick question on um, the special envoy for the Northern Triangles visit. Mm -hmm. He's traveling to Guatemala and El Salvador, mm -hmm. but to, not to Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, at least, Vice, Vice President Harris hasn't called um, President Juan Orlando mm -hmm. Hernandez of Honduras as well. Are you trying to isolate or send some sort of message to his government, given the allegations against him by U.S. federal prosecutors? Uh, I fully expect that uh, we will uh, be engaging with appropriate uh, Honduran uh, 
uh, government officials, um, including upon their return. Uh, there will be a meeting, I expect, with the Honduran foreign minister um, who will be visiting the United States um, upon their return. Um, as we've said before, we are deeply concerned uh, about the challenges that the people of Honduras are facing right now. Uh, the effects of COVID-19 compounded by the impacts of not one but two hurricanes. Uh, it's led to a 15% economic contraction as well as food insecurity. Uh, we continue to stand with the Honduran people as they uh, confront uh, these challenges. We will continue to stand uh, with the Honduran people uh, and civil society and those members of the Honduran government that are committed to fighting corruption with us um, because we know that our goal has to be to address these root causes, uh, these root drivers of migration if we're going to find uh, a long-term solution to this challenge. Does President Hernandez present one of those challenges? I'm hearing a lot of things coming Sorry. at me. Does, does President Hernandez present one of those challenges? Uh, I will say that um, uh, corruption uh, continues to be um, uh, a, uh, a challenge when it comes to uh, our relationship uh, with Honduras. We are committed to partnering with the Hondur Honduran people, uh, with elements of Honduran civil society, and with those in the Honduran government that are committed to working with us uh, to root out the corruption that has become uh, really endemic uh, to that country. Yes. Yeah, um my question is regarding El Salvador, too. Uh, President Bukele announced uh, a couple of hours ago uh, a series of donations that will receive from the Chinese government. And on the other hand, in uh, recent days, we have seen evident distancing of the Salvadoran government with the Biden administration. We even saw uh, President Bukele insult and attack uh, Congresswoman Norma, Norma Torres. And he also asked the Latino community to not vote for uh, her in California. Um, what is the position of the Biden's administration regarding this relationship between El Salvador and China? And, China? and um, China's approach with the Northern Triangle region uh, represent any concerns uh, uh, for you? And um, the other question is uh, regarding the uh, combat to the root causes of immigration. Uh, President Bukele said that he will uh, veto a law that was approved uh, last week for the National Assembly to uh, punish all the smugglers in, in Central America. So what's, what's the position? To, to punish all of the, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The traffickers and Traffic. coyotes, yeah, mm. in Central America. Uh, well, Secretary Blinken spoke to um, this broad challenge the other week in his remarks from Brussels. Uh, and he said at the time uh, that it would not be the policy of the United States uh, to force our partners to choose between the United States and China. Uh, we will offer a partnership um, that works uh, in our interests and also uh, that works uh, towards the interests of our partners, including uh, our partners in uh, our own hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, when it comes to El Salvador, we enjoy a strong uh, relation, uh, relationship with El Salvador and its people. Um, we'll continue to work closely with our Salvadoran partners to address the challenges we've talked about in this, um, uh, in, in this broader realm. Uh, that includes irregular migration, it includes corruption, it includes impunity, governance, respect for human rights, economic opportunity, uh, and security uh, as well. Uh, we'll also focus on preserving uh, democratic standards, and we look forward to President Bukele uh, to restore strong separation of powers uh, where they've been eroded and to demonstrate his government's uh, commitment to transparency and accountability to the people of El Salvador. Um, we'll continue to emphasize uh, that to political leaders the importance of appropriate democratic institutions as we partner with them. Uh, and of course, we'll also engage with civil society groups and to promote freedom of expression and independent, independent media uh, and the protection of uh, journalists. Our goal in all of this is to create the conditions uh, where the people of El, so El Salvador uh, can live healthy, uh, successful lives and, and to thrive. Um, we value this relationship. We value this partnership. It's a partnership uh, that is not only in the interests of uh, the people of El Salvador, but it's also in the interests of the American people. I'm sorry, we have to um, cut this short, but... Uh, ahead of the 2 p.m. coronavirus uh, conference, do you have an estimate on how many uh, State Department staff globally, including local staff, mm -hmm. have been vaccinated? I don't have that number in front of me. What I can say is that we will soon have an update um, on our um, efforts to provide 
the vaccine to um, embassies uh, and missions worldwide. Um, I think uh, we have made uh, tremendous progress. As you know, uh, some 80% uh, of our vaccine supply has been sent uh, to missions and to embassies uh, around the world. Um, and I think within weeks, um, we will be in a position to say uh, that all of our um, uh, officials around the world uh, have received access to the vaccine. On the Iran, um, how long do you... Oh, sorry, we, we haven't gotten to the back. Um, following the human rights report detailing egregious abuses in China, do you think that American companies should reevaluate their participation in the Olympics next year in a sponsorship role? Well, look, um, I will... Uh, the, the human rights report was... Uh, quite strong um, when it came to what we are seeing uh, in China, what we have seen in China. Um, it, of course, called uh, what has transpired, what is transpiring in Xinjiang uh, genocide. Um, I'm not going to offer advice to U.S. companies um, from this podium. What I can say is that when it comes to the issues of uh, the issue of the uh, Beijing Olympics, um, that's something that uh, we're consulting closely with our allies and partners. Um, we're consulting closely with them, um, not only on that specific issue, but also on the broader issue of China's human rights record. Uh, you saw a concrete manifestation of that when, together with our Canadian, Brits, and European partners, uh, we rolled out sanctions in recent days. Uh, targeting those who have been responsible for some of the most egregious abuses of human rights when it comes uh, to Xinjiang. So um, we'll coordinate with them very uh, closely on the question of the Olympics, but I don't have an update to share at this time. Last one on Yemen, please. Is there any update about the diplomatic efforts about Yemen, and when would uh, the special envoy to Yemen, uh, uh, Tim Lender King, go back again to the region? And on Afghanistan, there are some reports that the upcoming Istanbul <laughs> Uh, the conference will begin uh, April, uh, April 16 and would last 10 days. Do you confirm the date? I, I'm, I, I'm not in a position to confirm anything about uh, an upcoming uh, conference in, in Turkey vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan. Uh, very quickly and finally uh, on Yemen, uh, we released a statement uh, last week to note that Special Envoy Linder King uh, returned on March uh, 31st, late last week, uh, from his travel to Saudi Arabia and Oman. Uh, he held productive meetings with Omani, Saudi, and Yemeni senior leaders uh, in coordination with uh, U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen, uh, Martin Griffiths. Um, Special Envoy Linder King and the uh, U.N. Uh, Special Envoy continue uh, to work side by side uh, to help bring about a ceasefire inclusive uh, political talks, as well as a durable agreement that addresses uh, the needs of uh, all Yemenis. They also discussed the dire humanitarian needs for the people of Yemen. Uh, to that end, we, and I said this uh, the other week, we welcomed uh, the Saudis' announcement last week to provide uh, more than $400 million, I believe it was $422 million, uh, in support for fuel products uh, in Yemen. Uh, that, of course, is um, uh, in addition to what we announced um, uh, uh, in the not-too-distant past um, regarding our own uh, uh, support to the people of Yemen as well. Thank you all very much. We have to rush up to get to the secretary, but we'll do this again tomorrow, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.